For the last 18 months or so, I've been using the Sony a7S III as not just a camera which I use for videography, but also photography, and it's been my main camera constantly. And now with a7R Mark V being out and having almost as much capability as the Sony a7S III, how do these two cameras really stack up against each other? So with the Sony a7R Mark V being the new kid on the block and being predominantly aimed at photography, we'll start there. Let's start with the obvious thing. The Sony a7S Mark III has only a 12 megapixel sensor, whereas the Sony a7R Mark V has a 61 megapixel sensor. And with the use of pixel shift technology, you can take a photo that's over 200 megapixels in total. But what do all of these pixels mean? When it comes to printing at 300 DPI, which is the industry standard when it comes to high quality print, the Sony A7S III can print at around about 14 by 11 inches whilst maintaining the 300 DPI. But for the most part, you could double their measurements and go down to around about 150 DPI and it still looked pretty good. Whereas the Sony A7R Mark V with its massive 61 megapixel sensor can print fairly big in comparison to the A7S III whilst maintaining the 300 DPI. That comes in at 31 by 21 inches, which is a little over four times larger than the Sony a7S III. And once again, with them measurements, you could easily double them, go down to 150 DPI, and it still looked pretty good. But regardless, still a win for the Sony a7R5, but the a7S III can still print up to a decent size. In terms of the amount of noise you get when you're increasing the ISO on these cameras, both cameras are pretty similar. If anything, the noise from the a7R5 is a little bit more pronounced, and that's because obviously when you zoom in to actually see the noise, it's a lot more defined because obviously more pixels. One thing I did notice about the Sony a7R Mark V is that when you got to around about 5,000 ISO, the blacks seemed to have a little shift towards the greens. Whereas on the Sony a7S III, that didn't happen, and the blacks stayed very similar throughout. But obviously, because we're shooting in RAW, this can easily be corrected inside Lightroom. One thing to remember is that these are the results for only photography. When it comes to video, the ISO works a little bit different, but then results are coming up, so stay tuned. Whilst we're talking about pixels, we may as well address the large elephant in the room, or in this case, shall we say, large file sizes. The Sony A7R Mark V can shoot in five different types of RAW format. Full uncompressed RAW files come out around about 127 megabytes each. Compressed RAW files come out around about half that, so around about 65 megabytes each. And on this camera, we also have the large, medium, and small lossless files, which are also RAW, and they come out around about 74, 44, and 34, respectively. The lossless RAW files are very similar to the full uncompressed RAW files, but you're dealing with a smaller amount of pixels. But if I'm honest, when looking at the large lossless, uncompressed and compressed RAW files, you can barely tell the difference, but I'm going to be doing a full video about them in the next couple of weeks, so make sure you subscribe to the channel if you want to see that. Whereas with the Sony A7S Mark III, we only have the option of compressed and uncompressed RAW files, and either of them are actually really small in file size. On top of all of this, on the Sony A7R Mark V, we get more options when it comes to autofocus over the Sony A7S Mark III. On the A7R Mark V, we now have the option for insects, planes, and also cars. Whereas with the Sony A7S III, you don't have any of them options, even in the latest firmware update. Moving on to the video test, we start the video test with one of the most important things some may say with the Sony cameras, and that is color. The color that the video gives you from the Sony A7R Mark V is one of the reasons I decided to sell my A7 III and upgrade to the Sony A7R Mark V because it's very good at matching colors to the Sony A7S Mark III. The pitch profile I'm using is an S-Log3 Gamma, but I have changed the color ever so slightly, but I've done a full video about the pitch profiles that I use on these cameras right here if you want to watch it. When it comes to checking it on a color checker, there is a slight difference in colors. It mainly comes down to the saturation, but if you wanted to, you could go into the pitch profile a little bit further and dial things in a little bit more. But if we wasn't here to compare the Sony A7R Mark V to the Sony A7S Mark III, we could just sit there and say that the A7R Mark V is really nice with the colors coming out of it. But when looking at the footage between the A7R5 and the A7S3, for some reason the screen on the back of the A7S3 looks better than what it does on the A7R5. When I had the A7S3, I was, I just didn't like it. When I got the A7S3, the screen just, it was a more true representation of the finished product. But I feel like the A7R5 doesn't quite have the same thing. I don't know what it is about it. Obviously, I don't know whether they've changed the screens or not, but it's just, it's just not as good. It doesn't really matter how it looks on screen because it matters about how it looks when it comes around to editing. But regardless, you want that, that little bit of true representation 
of the footage you're shooting. Now we move on to one of the two largest selling points for me when it comes to the Sony A7R Mark V, and that is slow motion. This camera does not have the option for 100, 120 frames a second in 4K, so if you are wanting that silky smooth slow motion, then this isn't the camera for you, and you should definitely get the Sony A7S Mark III because that does have that ability. But if you can deal with only 50 and 60 frames a second, then stick around. The A7 Mark IV didn't quite break the internet like its predecessor, the A7 Mark III. The A7 Mark IV did have the ability to shoot in S and Q mode at 50 and 60 frames a second in 4K, but not at 100 or 120 frames a second, very similar to the A7R Mark V. But when it came to the 50 and 60 frames a second, that did have a crop factor of around 1.5 to 1.6 times. But the A7R Mark V gets rid of that crop factor almost completely, with the crop only being around 1.1 to 1.2 times. Sure, it's not quite as good as the Sony A7S Mark III, but it's pretty good to say the least. And regardless, when I'm filming video right now, I'm using active stabilization, which gives me a 1.1 times crop. I do that on both of the cameras, so I don't really see the difference between this and S and Q mode that much. Speaking of stabilization, when it comes to the comparison between these two cameras, both of them have the option of no stabilization, steady shot, and active stabilization for all the modes, apart from the A7R Mark V, which can't have active stabilization in 8K. With active stabilization on, shooting at 16 millimeters and treating it almost like a vlogging camera, you do get a little bit of wobble in the corners when walking, but for the most part, it's pretty good. Compared with other camera manufacturers, such as the Canon EOS R5, they recently did an update to try and minimize the wobble which they get in the corners. But in my personal opinion, Sony have always done really well when it comes to the active stabilization, and the wobble, yes, it's there, but it's very, very minimal. The Sony A7S Mark III can only output 4K, and that's due to the amount of pixels which are available on the sensor. 4K for most situations is more than plenty, but when you compare it to other camera manufacturers out there, such as Canon and Blackmagic, they're now putting out 6K and 8K, and that is where the A7R Mark V steps in. Due to the Sony A7R Mark V having 61 megapixels, this can actually record 8K internally. But we only have the option for 8K in 24 and 25 frames a second in standard movie mode. 8K obviously looks crispier than 4K, but you do get a 1.2 times crop factor in it and you don't have the option for active stabilization, only steady shot. For the most part, I would still use the 8K footage in a standard 4K timeline like I'm doing right now. But with doing that, you now have the ability to be able to crop in and move the image around a little bit more than you would do with 4K. And even though this camera has 8K internally, how usable is it? The problem that we have with these large pixel count cameras is the rolling shutter and unfortunately the Sony A7R Mark V is no different. The Sony A7S Mark III is really good when it comes to the rolling shutter and it's almost unnoticeable when shooting in 4K. Unfortunately the same thing cannot be said about the Sony A7R Mark V and unfortunately when shooting in 4K you do have a higher degree of rolling shutter but it's not quite as bad as what I actually expected. However, I had the thought of testing 8K because obviously with 8K you're dealing with a larger amount of pixels and sure enough, yeah, it's worse, much worse. And in my opinion, pretty much unusable for anything which is gonna be fast paced where you're wanting to track something like a person, a car, anything like high action. But yeah, I expected it. I think we all did, so no surprise there. But what we have to remember is it's predominantly a photography camera and not a video camera like the A7S Mark III. Both of these cameras have around about 14 to 15 stops on paper when it comes to dynamic range when filming at their base ISOs, a 640 and 800 ISO. This is definitely not the most scientific test out there on the internet. Uh, I'm not quite Gerald Undone, but as you can see from looking at these clips, they are almost indistinguishable between the two. I think they both look great. I'd be happy to film with either of these. Um, yeah, let's move on. Now this will come at no surprise. The Sony A7S Mark III, when filming in specifically S-Log3, has a base ISO of 640, and a second ISO, a base ISO, a second native ISO, whatever you want to call it, of 12,800 ISO, meaning that when you get to 12,800 ISO, there's minimal noise, the same as when it's at 640 ISO. The A7R Mark V is very similar to the A7 Mark IV, with a base ISO of 800, and then when you get to around about 3,200, that's almost what you would call a second base ISO, because the noise seems to drop down ever so slightly. But even at 12,800 ISO, if you need to use 12,800 ISO, then use it, it's not terrible. 
From the test that I've done, 8000, 10,000 ISO is perfectly usable on the Sony A7R Mark V, but obviously it will depend on how well your scene is lit. As we all know with the S-Log3, a lot of the noise comes from the shadows and the blacks, uh, but if you're having to film in a darker environment, then this isn't the camera for you, and I'd probably look at the Sony A7S Mark III or even the FX3. When it comes to overheating and the Sony A7S Mark III, I've actually never, ever got this thing to overheat. I'll be straight up, on both of these cameras, the A7S III and the A7R Mark V, I have the high temp auto offsetting set to high, so these can get incredibly hot and they still won't overheat. But when I say incredibly hot, it's not anything that's going to burn you, and I'd always recommend when you're doing any kind of filming, pull the screen out because the back does get fairly warm. That's where all the heat will escape from, so if you close that off, obviously it's going to overheat a lot faster than if you was to, you know, open the screen up. I can happily say that when I have the screen out like I've got right now, when filming at 4K 422 10-bit, filming at 25 frames a second, I was able to use a full battery filming continuously, filled a full 120 gigabyte memory card, and it didn't overheat once. That test was done right here in my room. It's not hot, it's not cold. Obviously, if you are outside in the blazing sun, then your results may vary ever so slightly, but for the most part, it doesn't really overheat at all. So the recording lengths of these cameras and the file size of these cameras are identical. The only difference between the two cameras is the addition of 8K, which films in XAVC HS, which is a H.265 codec on the Sony A7R Mark V. With brand new formatted 120 gigabyte card in 8K, I can record for around about 33 minutes or almost two hours if I'm filming in 4K. When it comes to my Sony A7S Mark III, I recommend people get the ProGrade V90 cards. Uh, they allow you to use any of the codecs apart from the all intro codec in S and Q mode. But also with that camera, you only need the V90 cards if you're shooting in 100 or 120 frames a second. 50 and 60 frames a second, you can use V60s, and it's no different on the Sony A7R Mark V. On this camera, I can use a V60 card and it will allow me to record in all the formats that I wish, apart from S and Q mode in all intro. I have a bunch of V90 cards that I use, but when it comes to the weddings, I have gone out and bought some V60 cards because these are much cheaper than the V90s and they will do the job perfectly fine when it comes to the wedding photography. Obviously, if you're using a high drive mode and you want to clear that buffer a little bit faster, then possibly get the V90 cards or even the CFX Express Type A cards. But like I say, they are much more expensive than the V60s, so buy whatever you need. Another reason I keep talking about why the A7R5 could also be a hybrid camera rather than just a straight up photography camera is because some of the features that it has over the A7S Mark III when it comes to just videography. One of the things I came across on the first day of having it is the fact that the camera has a variable shutter. The variable shutter allows you to change the actual shutter speed in much smaller increments to what you normally would be able to. Therefore, instead of having it one over 50, you can decrease it or increase it by 0.1 every single time. So if you're having to deal with any flicker, let's say on the TV or the lights, you can turn the, on the variable shutter, adjust it and get rid of it. That's one thing, even on the latest firmware update for the A7S III, it just doesn't have. And let's face it, Sony then have the guts to turn around and say that the A7S III is predominantly a video camera, yet it hasn't got all the features that the A7R5 has when it comes to video. <sighs> you see what I'm saying? So, I don't really know how to end this video. I don't really have a conclusion as such. Both the A7S Mark III and the A7R Mark V do different things particularly well. The A7R Mark V is a phenomenal photography camera, and for anybody out there who's wanting to do video as well, the A7R Mark V will satisfy your needs in most areas. But regardless of the features that Sony put onto the A7R Mark V, when it comes to the rolling shutter and certain features that the A7S Mark III has, this will always have the A7R Mark V B. As always, my answer to all these videos is, what do you really need as a creator? If you can truly answer that, then you'll know which one is better for the needs that you require. But regardless, they are both similarly priced and you get a lot of camera for your money. Finally, I'd like to apologize for the length of this video. I've wanted to cram in as much as possible and be really thorough. If I've missed anything in particular, I'm really sorry. But over the next few weeks, I will be doing a lot more about the A7R Mark V and the A7S Mark III. So if you want to see any of that, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for all your notifications. And if you do, I'll see you right there. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.